The Hero's Journey by Midori Snyder. In hero narratives, a young man leaves the familiar home of his birth and ventures into the unknown world where the fantastic waits to challenge him. Along the journey, his worth as a man and as a hero is tested, but when the trials are done, he returns home again in triumph, bringing to his society newfound knowledge, maturity, and often a magic bride. The transformation of a young man into a responsible adult is sealed when the hero marries his magic bride and assumes kingship. While no less heroic, how different is the journey of young women? In folk tales, the rite of passage from adolescence to adulthood is confirmed by marriage and the assumption of adult roles. In an exogamous society, young women must leave forever the familiar home of their birth to become brides elsewhere. Venturing out into the dangerous world of the fantastic, they know they will never return home. Instead, they will eventually arrive in new kingdoms and villages. There, disguised as dirty-faced servants and goose girls, they struggle to complete their initiation into adulthood by carving out new identities in foreign lands. With their re-emergence as adult women, they too bring the gifts of knowledge, maturity, and fertility to their new communities. In the language of folk tales, abstract ideas are represented by concrete images. Footnote, from Harold Schub, Oral Narrative Process and the Use of Models, New Literary History, Winter 1975, and also Harold Schub, Body and Image in Oral Narrative Traditions, New Literary History, Winter 1977. Traditional storytellers have used terrifying events to create the emotional experience of grief and abandonment, in which a young woman is not only set out on her journey away from home, but assured of the impossibility of ever returning. In the armless maiden narratives, a girl is mutilated by a trusted family member and then thrust like a wounded animal into the forest. There can be no return to this home corrupted by violence. The girl must move forward in her journey to a new destination where she will reconstruct not only her severed arms, but her identity as an adult woman as well. My first experience with the Armless Maiden narrative was a powerful version performed by Miss Nanganile Masitatu Zanani, a Chosa storyteller from South Africa. Her version is frightening and brutal. A widowed father tries to coerce his young daughter into filling the sexual role of his deceased wife. When the girl refuses to have sex with him, he takes her into the woods and cuts off her arms, leaving her to die. The horror of this opening passage is balanced only by its dramatic ending, when the girl's arms are restored on the shore of a magic lake, and she is able at last, as a whole woman, to take her baby into her arms. The armless maiden narrative stayed with me for many years, and I found myself hunting down other versions. What surprised me the most was discovering how ubiquitous this complex and violent story was. There were versions told all over Europe and Asia, some less sexual in their tone, but every bit as gruesome. Fathers and brothers hacking away the limbs of young girls, either in rage or in payment to the devil. And there would always be that complicated twist in the middle of the story, the false exchange of letters that forces the armless girl back into nature, where the final act of initiation occurs. It is a narrative with a strange hiccup in the middle. The brutality of the opening scene seems resolved as the armless girl is rescued in a garden and then married to the prince, but she has not completed her journey of transformation. She is not whole, not the girl she was nor the woman she was meant to be. The narratives make it clear that without her arms, she is unable to fulfill her role as an adult. She can do nothing for herself, not even care for her own child. Conflict is reintroduced into the narrative to send the girl back on her journey of initiation alone. Every narrative version concludes with what is in effect a second marriage. The woman, now whole, her arms restored by an act of magic, has become herself the magic bride, aligned with the creative power of nature. She does not return to the prince's castle, but waits in the forest for him to find her. When he comes to propose marriage the second time, it is a marriage of equals based on respect and not pity. Although I believe that the armless maiden narratives are about rites of passage to adulthood, within the story is the echo of abuse. Heroes may be impoverished or robbed of their royal birthrights, but rarely are they so vindictively mutilated before they are turned out into their journeys. Storytellers know well the constant underlying fear and threat that surrounds the lives of women in their communities from childhood into adulthood. The exploitation of these terrifying images in the narrative may be extreme, but they are the dark threads pulled out of the fabric of our shared experiences as women. We are repulsed and angered by the brutal actions, not because such events could never happen, but because they do. The fantastic emerges quickly in the story to magically soften the pain of the mutilation and move the listener away from the horror of the event and into the journey of self-discovery. Though the terror of the attack is short, as long as the girl remains mutilated, we are reminded of the continuing painful sensation that such blows inflict. Survivors of abuse know that isolation well, whether as a child stripped of innocence among those still cloaked, or as an adult unable to bridge the fear of betrayal and trust in the love of another. It takes acts of self-determination and power to restore a sense of wholeness after abuse. In a number of European versions of the Armless Maiden, the girl, mutilated by her brother or father in a thorn grove, speaks out against the crime with the calm assurance of a prophet. Armless and bleeding, she tells him that the thorn he is about to step on will be removed only by her hand. In that moment of intense pain and betrayal, she envisions her life restored to wholeness. And what is more, she envisions her forgiveness of his terrible crime. 
The narrative is not about her survival as a victim, rather it is about her journey as a committed traveler fully aware of her destination. The need for restoration and reconciliation are not the armless girls alone in the versions employing the motif of the Thorn Grove. Abusers, too, are isolated by the shame and brutality of their violent acts. The brother or father in the Thorn Grove versions barely survive from the armless maiden's absence, their bodies imprisoned and pierced by a punishing vine of thorns that grows from the offending thorn in their heel. When the armless maiden returns, her transformation from a girl into a woman, possessed of creative power, is confirmed as she frees her brother or father from the prison of thorns with the touch of her restored hands. In so doing, she removes forever the corrupting taint of violence, allowing them both to continue in their new lives, unshackled by the past. In finding my own voice for the retelling of this story, I selected those images that perhaps more strongly address the underlying thread of abuse and its forgiveness. But in one aspect of the narrative, I created a scene that is not found as part of the traditional versions of the Armless Maiden. Since traditional storytellers have accepted at the outset that the girl would have her arms restored at the proper time, indicating her reemergence as an adult, they were not as concerned with how her arms were restored, only that the girl must be returned to nature, and there nature would determine when she had reached the apex of her journey. Though nature would still make it happen, I wanted the armless maiden to recognize and literally grab that moment for herself. When she demands of the magic fish to restore her arms that she may save herself and her child, it is the first real step in her reemergence as an adult. It is also the moment when the adult identity is grafted onto the once wounded stock of childhood, making whole again the girl's history. In one luminous moment, her past is restored, her present made manifest in the power of her hands, and her future assured as she lifts her child out of the foaming water.